Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Kreitas. Today is Thursday, May 27th, 2021. Thank you so much for joining me. The title of today's podcast, Debt Distorts Reality. And oh boy, doesn't it. So we're going to talk about market performance. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the discussion that some of the major Wall Street banks had with Congress and in an exchange between Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan and Chase, and Senator Elizabeth Warren with respect to overdraft fees. I want to get to that because I just want to point out the ridiculousness of our system. It's a valid point that is made by the senator, but this is just, I don't know if it's the epitome of the system of, uh, as to what we're doing here with all of these bailouts and everything. I'll get it, into it in detail in a moment. But again, you can either laugh at this or it's going to make you cry. So those are your choices. Well, we got Demented Joe wants to put out a $6 trillion budget. $6 trillion budget. These people don't even care anymore. I mean, right off the bat, that puts us in the hole about $2.5 trillion. Right out of the gate. $2.5 trillion deficit. These people do not even care anymore. It's Thursday, so we have our traditional weekly update with respect to initial jobless claims data and the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. And I also want to make sure we have some time to discuss U.S. retail sales. This is uh, the figure, the data point came out a couple of weeks ago, and I meant to get to it. We talked about it very briefly. I wanted to go into it in a little more detail, so I'm hoping we have time in today's podcast to do so, because this is very much a part of the theme in the today's title of debt distorting reality because huge deviation from trend okay now you can understand the massive sell-off or the massive drop i should say with respect to this data point of retail sales because of the pandemic because things shut down across the board across the globe we see this almost miraculous v-shaped recovery with respect to this data point, but then it just keeps on going up, up, and away. And I'm going to put that into perspective because this is occurring because debt distorts reality. This is a game of musical chairs, and I believe that the music is going to be stopping in the not-too-distant future, and we're going to find out what reality really looks like, and it's not going to be pretty. And, of course, one of the worst things about it is most people do not have a clue. So it's really going to impact people, probably even worse than what happened during the pandemic when this house of cards comes tumbling down, because this is a global phenomenon. This is not just here in the United States. There is one bubble after the next. It is a very, very fragile system, and the slightest of pinpricks can cause a a daisy chain effect that is just going to reverberate the world over, and there's not going to be that many safe havens. There's just not going to be when this all comes down. And they are trying like hell to change the narrative, to distract us, to make us look over here. And as I stated yesterday, I think the blame game is well afoot, well underway. And if these markets do slip, it's set up to blame countries, individuals, other institutions, all away from the politicians, all away from the policymakers, And this is something that will be done on a global stage. It's not just going to be the U.S. and some people here blaming others. It's going to be the Chinese blaming us, the Europeans blaming the Chinese, the Russians blaming us, vice versa. You know, it's just finger pointing. Nobody is going to take any type of responsibility. But that doesn't mean that it's going to be any better for the average Joe and Jane out there. That's not going to do any good whatsoever. In fact, it'll probably add to our problems because if people buy into the propaganda that it was always somebody else's fault and not ours, well then what are we going to be led into? Are we going to be led into some other conflict or war? God forbid. So just be mindful of this. So market performance in the Forex markets. We have the dollar index at 90 spot 06. 90 spot 06 currently up overnight about one-tenth of one percent. Other major cross-currency pairs, not too much movement. However, the dollar continues weakening against the Chinese yuan and is down two-tenths 
of 1%. Bitcoin is down 1% overnight at $38,000 per coin. Overnight futures, we have the Dow Jones Industrial Average up about one half of 1%. The S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100 are both currently up about one third of 1%. The cash trade in Japan is putting on a solid gain of over 600 points, putting uh, percentage-wise 2.2%. And this is off of the back of some news that the Japanese jobless rate has increased to 2.8%. So their jobless rate increases and the markets love it because I guess they think the Bank of Japan is going to throw more stimulus into the system. Right? That's how it works. Mixed bag across the pond in Europe. However, the Italian markets did put on a solid gain of 1.1%. Cash trade in Australia also up solidly, up 1.2%. Chinese stocks are currently flat. On the commodity front, WTI $67.17 a barrel. Brent $69.75. Natural gas $2.97. Gasoline $2.16. And of course, this weekend in the States is... Memorial Day holiday, so it's likely that there's going to be a lot of drivers on the road, especially as the economy continues to open up. So we're likely going to see some higher prices over the weekend. Gold and silver still hanging on strong, but both are currently in the red overnight. Gold, $1,893 an ounce. Silver at $27.76 an ounce. We're getting close to the end of the month already, and as I have been stating here, uh, for the past several weeks, I really want to see gold close the month at 1900 or above. My previous number, and it's still a solid number at 1870, and it looks like that's going to be the case unless something happens uh, during the uh, day session tomorrow. But that is a solid price target. The 1870 level to 1900, as far as I'm concerned, because you're looking at various levels of technical resistance that gold has been breaking through and quite solidly same thing with silver again that price point was at 28 dollars and we're flirting very close with that 28 handle same same thing as with gold it's been slowly taking out various points of resistance and it's been consolidating since uh it, it made recent highs back in august okay of last year so it's due for a big move i think that's to the upside because the fundamentals are extremely strong for gold and silver, and the technicals look pretty damn good as far as I'm concerned as well. Copper is at $4.67 a pound, a strong day for copper, and lumber is at $1,323 per 1,000 linear board feet. And to round it out, Uncle Sam's 10-year junk note is at 1.62%, so continuing to be range-bound. All right, so there you have it with some market performance. That exchange, that back and forth between Senator Elizabeth Warren, you know Pocahontas, and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, J.P. or excuse me, <clears throat> Jamie Dimon, was about overdraft fees, <clears throat> and she basically was asking why the bank charged their customers, you know, almost two billion dollars, I believe the number was, if I remember correctly. Well, it was definitely over a billion dollars in overdraft fees throughout 2020. I mean, that's a legitimate question. It was a pandemic. Was there no customer service? No, of course not. There, there's never any customer service, no matter how many commercials J.P. Morgan can put out there on the airwaves, no, no matter how many times the CEO or the CFO or any other anybody else who's in a position of leadership at that bank on a conference call, on an interview, no matter how much they talk about the customer, they're screwing them over. They're screwing them over. And of course, the kicker is, we continue to bail these people out. And that's the funny thing, even with Elizabeth Warren, she's right to call him out on this, but she voted for the Nobody Cares Act. She votes for all of the stimulus. What did she think happened? Where does she think all of this money's going? It went to the banks. It went to major corporations because they were deemed essential. You're a small business? No, you weren't essential. Even if you were offering the same goods and services of those bigger box stores or those bigger corporations, you were declared, you were deemed non-essential. Extremely insulting. Where's Elizabeth Warren on that one? I mean, does she not know what she was voting for? Of course she doesn't. Or of course she does. I mean, take your poison. She's either in on it and just playing a role here or she's completely incompetent. Neither is a good choice. And it's not just her, it's the whole lot of them. 
Again, that's why I, I like to continuously remind the audience to never forget 96 to nothing, no votes for America. And there was another one that was 100 to nothing, no votes for America. Of course, I'm talking about the Senate and the Nobody Cares Act and various forms thereof. But nonetheless, a decent question. You charged your customers who were going through a pandemic, an extremely hard time for many people, and you had the audacity, you had the nerve to continue to charge them overdraft fees. Meanwhile, you got bailed out. Meanwhile, the Federal Reserve's printing money like a banana republic, allowing you to reap massive underwriting fees for all of the M&A activity that's going on and for all of the extra corporate debt that is being thrown into the system because the Federal Reserve is the backstop. They said, well, if nobody buys it in the market, we'll buy it. So corporation after corporation said, oh, well, we got to refinance. We got to throw more debt out there because we get, somebody's going to buy it. So fantastic. There's going to be a bid. We're going to do it. Well, that doesn't just happen. Somebody's got to underwrite those bonds. Well, guess what? It's these major banks. That's why they've been making huge profits. And don't forget their trading desk profits as well. Because the stock market and the bond market have basically become perpetual money-making machines because the Federal Reserve is there to backstop any type of loss. If there's no bid, don't worry about it. We'll come in and we'll bid up the market. It's a complete joke. And yet they still charge their customers who are going through a pandemic a billion dollars in fees. And I have to give credit to one of our listeners here at the Capitol News who made a comment about uh, overdraft fees several, several months ago. I mean, well, it was well back into in 2020. Because the point I was making about all of these stimulus programs was that it was just a pass-through bailout. And this audience member said, yeah, you got to pay attention to some of these overdraft fees that are likely going to come down the pike too because all this money that Uncle Sam is going to be giving to these people is simply going to end up paying for these overdraft fees. So we're still in the same vein of this being a pass-through bailout. But, you know, that's exactly what happened. And that's exactly what continues to occur as we make our way through 2021 because we are nowhere near being out of the woods. This is all smoke and mirrors. This is the debt-distorting reality. People think this is great. They think it's fantastic. Our twin deficit is blowing up. Twin deficit being our federal budget deficit and our trade deficit. We're not producing things here, so our trade deficit is ballooning. And yet you still have people who get marched on to CNBC and other financial medias, media networks, and they say, this is fantastic, that's great, that's a sign that the economy is coming roaring back, that people have money. Yeah, they have money because we got a printing press turned on full speed. Not because of production. I mean, if it was that simple, why did it take us so long to figure this out? That you don't have to produce anything to actually go buy something. Just have a central bank print the money, give it to you, and then you're done. Because that's not how it works, folks. Free was never so expensive. And that's what I'm talking about, as I stated previously. One of the worst things about what's going on is that most people have no idea what's going on. And by the time they realize what's happening, it's going to be too late. It's like the calf being fatted before the slaughter. He thinks he's uh, the, king of the king of the castle. Look at all the food this guy has given me and everything, all this attention. It's fantastic. Before he knows it, his head's chopped off. That's what's going on here. We are being fatted before the slaughter. And we talk about housing, autos, Food prices, utility, energy costs, health care costs, everything. All that funny money that you were given can evaporate like that. Because that's how it works. There is no free lunch. If you wanted to see prices coming down in a real market economy, it's because you have more people working, producing more goods. Increase to productivity. New innovations. Driving costs lower, which in turn bring your consumer prices down. Not because of any type of economic collapse, but because of innovation and productivity gains. That's how it's supposed to operate. You can print money, you cannot print productivity. As I have been stating here for well over a year. Because it's common sense. But people don't want to believe it. Because debt distorts reality. 
And wait till we get to retail sales to see how much reality we're distorting. It's really sickening. So I'll give kudos to Senator Elizabeth Warren for asking the question. But she voted for this stuff that continues to bail these people out too. What doesn't she understand? Well, she doesn't understand a lot. So again, Demented Joe has, is putting out a budget of $6 trillion. And of course, his Treasury Secretary, Janet Dingbat Yellen, is all on board with this. And, you know, you just have to go back, not even that long ago, to look at her comments with respect to the debt and saying that it's, you know, out of control. Of course, she didn't put it that way, but that it needed to be handled, that it can become a problem. Now, evidently, I mean, it's, it's, it's several trillion dollars worse now than it was when she made those comments at the first time. And now it's apparently not a problem. These people take us for idiots, ladies and gentlemen, and, and they get away with it. Okay, so that's why they continue to do it. Okay, so right out of the gate, you're talking about a two and a half trillion dollar deficit. Just off of that alone. And that assumes that they're not going to go over budget, which of course they always do. All right. So what's two and a half trillion dollars? It's over 10% of GDP. If we have a gross domestic product of about $22 trillion, two and a half trillion is over 10%. This is, you know, we're in the land of Banana Republic. All right? That's exactly what's going on here, and it's only getting worse. Because if you think that they put out a budget of $6 trillion and they're going to come under budget, I got a bridge to sell you. So it's just going to be interesting to see what they throw in it. And, you know, they're talking about more stimulus checks coming out too. Because retail sales, it's following, it's following the trend they get a stimulus check, they go up. No stimulus check, they go down. Okay. Not that hard to see here. But they want to make you think. They want to make you believe that everything is okay because that's all that they have left. It's the narrative. This is a con job. A con man is a confidence man. They are just trying to instill confidence in the system, a system that is corrupt, that is fraudulent, that is criminal. They want to continue to prop it up. And if they got to pay you off with stimulus checks, your sit down and shut up money, that's exactly what they're going to do. And that's exactly what they have done. And it's going to continue to work until it doesn't. All right, let's get to the Department of Labor's report with initial jobless claims. So for the week ending May 22nd, initial claims on a seasonally adjusted basis came in at 406 the lowest figure uh, since the pandemic began. So again, 406,000. Last week's figure was unrevised. I couldn't even recall the last time there was not a revision. It's been well over a year. And last week's figure was at 444,000. On a non-seasonally adjusted basis, the figure comes in at about 420,000. For the week ending May 15th, Continuing claims on a seasonally adjusted basis came in at 3.6 million. On a non-seasonally adjusted basis, the number came in at 3.5 million. For the week ending May 22nd, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program comes in at about 93,500. So in aggregate, seasonally adjusted initial claims at 406,000, the PUA at 93,000. We're below, we're, we're below 500,000. Now we'll see obviously next week with the revisions, but we are just below 500,000, which is still a bad number. It is still two and a half times the figure prior to the pandemic. So this is still not a pretty number, but it is most definitely moving in the right direction. It is most definitely better than the numbers that we have seen throughout last year and even into this year, well into this year. Okay. And then for the week ending May 8th, this is the aggregate figure of regular state, federal employees, newly discharged veterans, the PUA and PEUC programs, extended benefits, state additional benefits, and work share gives us a grand total of 15.8 million. So 15.8 million Americans continue to claim some form of unemployment insurance. Again, this data point lags by a couple weeks, the week ending May 8th. This is a week-over-week -week decline of 175,000 Americans. The biggest decrease came in the PUA program, a decrease of 90,000. And extended benefits, 
decreased week over week by 114 thousand. And the biggest gainer was in the PEUC program, putting on 49,000. So perhaps extended benefits are running out. We do know that several states across the country have canceled the additional $300 per week or whatever it is uh, in additional benefits that are coming from the federal government because people are concerned, and rightly so, and we have mentioned this many times here before, that people are being incentivized to stay home and not go out and look for work, not take a job, because they are being paid just as much, if not more, and even if they're getting paid a little less, they say, well, I don't have to deal with traffic, I don't have to deal with snooty customers, I don't have to deal with my boss who I can't stand or colleagues that I don't like, etc., etc., and they'll say, well, yeah, that's a trade-off I'll make. So it'll be interesting to see what happens, and it's also a jobs market that remains highly distorted as well because of all of the funny money sloshing around in the system. And speaking of funny money sloshing around through the system, with respect to overnight reverse repo operations, hitting another all-time high. All right, so something is amiss. We mentioned this earlier this week. Yesterday, a financial st storm a Bruin, very likely, very likely, because it was the opposite back in September of 2019. All right. In September of 2019, there was not enough liquidity in the system. Now there's too much liquidity in the system. And when you go from September of 2019 to February, March of 2020, well, you have that massive market crash. Now, of course, it's blamed on the pandemic, but you're only talking a short five, six months from when something was blowing up in the repo market to a major stock market crash. And just conveniently, you have this global pandemic taking hold. Now we have the reverse. We have too much liquidity in the system. What's going to happen five, six months from now, which is going to basically take us to the end of the year already. Just something to be mindful of, because these are idiots at the helm. They don't know what they're doing. This is one massive experiment, and it is not going to end well at all. And it is causing so many distortionary effects that a lot of models that people build and look at, and I look, I, I look at a lot of people's models all the time on, on a Twitter feed, on other sites that I, I listen to and follow, and, yeah, I like it when you're in a more normal environment. We are far from normal. So I think we have to start being a little bit more creative in our thinking, thinking outside the box, and just being ready and prepared for anything to the best of our capabilities. Because these markets are broken. Uh, it is a central banker's world for the time being until market forces say otherwise. And market forces could take the form of system exhaustion, it could be some sort of massive bankruptcy in a, in a large corporation. It could be an exogenous shock, like a pandemic, like a war, or some other type of major geopolitical event. So the list is very long, and it could come from anywhere at any time. And when you're talking about a system that is this fragile, it could be anything. The dominoes are set. You knock one down, the rest are coming, no matter what these central bankers and federal governments do at this point. Because they've thrown everything and the kitchen sink at COVID-19 as their justification to, you know, to do whatever they wanted to do. And they're getting away with it. They're not going to be able to do it next time. At least, I hope not. Because then, what, what are we even talking about? There, there's just simply no reality. There's just no reality. There's, there's no common sense. There's no basic uh, understanding of economics. There's no realistic functioning of anything. It's just a complete joke and a scam. So just print everybody $10 million and call it a day. But they won't do that because they know it doesn't work. But if they can benefit themselves, if they can benefit those in their inner circle, that's what they're going to continue to do. And that's why you look at this massive gap in wealth inequality, which in many parts of the world, is already causing a lot of political strife, bringing people out onto the streets, just a matter of time before it makes its way into more developed countries, including the United States of America.
So onward to the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. So week over week decrease of about $19 billion. Recall last week was an all-time high at $7.922 trillion. We are now at $7.903 trillion. So again, a decrease week over week of $19 billion. However, the prior week we saw that increase of $90 billion. And a lot of that was probably due to the fact that the equity markets were having a bit of a sell-off. A bit of a sell-off. So the Federal Reserve panicked. And you have to understand something, folks. This is the market. This is not correlation. This is causation. You know how we know? Take the money out. Take the money out. Remove everything that the Federal Reserve has done over the last year. And let's see where equity prices are. Okay? This is causation. Monetary measures, parts one and part two on the capitalnews.com. You can find them on our YouTube channel as well. Check them out. If you've listened to them before, listen to them again. Watch that presentation. Look at those charts and graphs. It's as easy to see as anything that there is. This is not correlation. It is causation. Take the money out and let's see where it is. But they're not going to do that because they know. They know what they're doing. They know who they're working for. So we're still waiting for an update on M1 and M2 money supply. We should have that next week. And uh, as we end uh, May, the first Friday of June will give us the jobs report. So that's going to be a very interesting statistic to see because it's really going to shape the narrative that's going to continue to come from the Federal Reserve and the federal government as to whether or not they have to do more or less. Okay, and we've talked at length about that April jobs report figure and how that was just a blessing in disguise, really, for the Federal Reserve and the federal government to say, oh, look how bad this number was at 266,000. The market was expecting a million jobs created in the month of April, but we got 266,000. See, we're not doing enough. There's more we can do. So if we get another weak number for the month of May, it's just going to continue to fuel their narrative that more needs to be done, and it'll justify it in their world. So it'll be more debt. It'll be more distortions. So talking about the, those distortions, let's get to U.S. retail sales. So again, you can find this on the Federal Reserve's website too, their Federal Reserve Economic Data website. Type in retail sales, and what I'm looking at is retail and food services total. Okay, so this is everything. And when you're looking at data, you typically just want to take a step back and just look at what the chart is kind of telling you. Are there any major deviations from trend? And if so, why might that be the case? Was it a recession? Was it a supply chain disruption? Was there some sort of geopolitical event? Was there some sort of major shift in demand preferences? And you start to think, why might this be the case? Why is there a deviation? Well, looking at this data going back to about 1993, we notice a couple major deviations from trend. The first one I'm going to mention is during the great financial crisis. Well, this is no surprise. This was one of the worst financial and economic environments since the Great Depression. So to see a major drop off in retail sales makes complete sense. Well, we peaked in retail sales in November of 2007. And we bottomed in March of 2009, okay? We did not recover, meaning we did not get back to that peak number in, in November of 2007 until early February, March of 2011. So you're talking over three years a little over three years to recover that peak before the great financial crisis took hold. Now, you would expect something like that to be the case. A little bit of a, something a little bit that's looking at the graph, it makes more sense intuitively speaking. It's a little bit more of a smoother transition to get back to it, allowing the economy to recover, to heal in time. It makes more intuitive sense. You fast forward to 2020 and you see this massive drop off because everything shut down. But then you also see this V-shaped recovery, massive V-shaped recovery. 
But not only do you see this massive V-shaped recovery that basic, basically took us back to where we were prior to everything being shut down. Okay, so everything shut down in March of 2020. So we peaked in February of 2020. We collapsed for a couple of months in 2020. The bottom is basically in April of last year. But come July, we were right back to where we were in February. A completely different narrative and a completely different story when compared to the great financial crisis. Because there was no Nobody Cares Act 1.0. It was just a bailout of the financial industry and some major corporations during the GFC. This time, no, you had to get your sit down and shut up money. And people spent it. This is why Amazon took off. This is, you know, people were at home. They can't go to their local stores, local coffee shop, local bars and restaurants. But they can order from Amazon. They can order from Walmart. They want to do some home repairs, some do-it-yourself projects. Lowe's and Home Depot did extremely well. And up and up we continue. But that's not it. We, we are at, for March, most recent data point, at 619, almost six, let's call it six, I'm going to round up a little bit, $620 billion. All right, this is retail sales for the month of March, $620 billion dollars where were we in february of 2020 526 billion dollars all right now this this trend it's a relatively smooth trend quite linear quite predictable we have pulled so much future purchasing activity forward to today it's not even funny Probably a couple years worth. Because even if we were to remove the deviation from the great financial crisis, we probably wouldn't even be at this level where we are today. So you can remove the deviation from the great financial crisis and the pandemic, and we wouldn't be at this price level. We would not be at $620 billion dollars. For the month of March in 2021. This is how ridiculous this whole system is. And I ask you, I, I, I suggest that you take the time to look this up. Again, Federal Reserve Economic Data. You can Google that. And then once you're in there, you can do their search engine in the, in the Federal Reserve Economic Data website. Retail sales, retail and food services. And this is the total. Again, you don't need to be a mathematician or an economist to know that this isn't right. But this is a perfect picture that encapsulates debt distorting reality. Because these sales didn't come from productivity. People aren't working. This came from a printing press. This is debt. This is funny money. This is not going to last. This is another vertical graph. One after the next, and that was the point of doing those capital economics presentations, monetary measures, part one and two, to show you how insane these economic figures are. That this is completely unsustainable. This isn't about base effects with this. This is a completely different story here. So that argument doesn't even hold water, doesn't even belong in this conversation. Because I'm not talking about percentage gains here. I'm just talking about how much money Americans are spending per month on retail sales. And where we are, from the most recent data point, again, in March of this year, about $620 billion is so far above trend. The only way you can justify this is to say that we have pulled so much future spending forward to today. So what does that mean? It means that the millennial generation and large parts even of Generation Z are screwed. Because that's their, that was supposed to be their productivity. That was supposed to be their economic benefit. It's not there. It's not there. We have stolen so much future growth and prosperity from those younger generations, it's not even funny. And that's why we're going to continue to see a lot of youth revolts and revolutions and protests globally. Because they know what they have been served. 
they know the hand that they have been dealt. And they don't like it. And they shouldn't like it. Because a lot of them didn't have anything to do with it. They haven't been around long enough to vote, to have a say, to understand fully what's going on. That's why we're far from out of the woods. And as I stated yesterday, we still have to contend with the fraud cycle. All these zombie corporations standing up. What happens if something happens and they can't make their debt payments? How many businesses are going to go out of business? Boom, like that. How many jobs does that equate to? My goodness, we, are, we, we have not solved a damn thing. And in fact, they have made the problem that much worse. As I'm stating, we have a triple whammy that we're staring at right in the face. Fiscal and monetary policies reminiscent as to what caused the Great Depression. A fascination with tech stocks and cryptocurrencies reminiscent of the dot-com era. And housing prices going through the roof reminiscent of the subprime era and the great financial crisis. Of course, it's a little bit different, and I've dis discussed those uh, distinguishing factors. But nonetheless, it is pricing a generation out of the housing market, and that too is going to cause some political problems as well. So again, we covered a lot of information here, but I wanted to make sure that we discussed retail sales. I encourage you to take the time again to look at this data point. This is completely unsustainable. It's completely ridiculous. It's com it is here simply to make things look better than what they actually are, to try to instill confidence in the system that these politicians and central bankers have things under control when they do not. Do not believe it for a second. Debt distorts reality. Do not forget it. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capital News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.